Lesson one is a historical overview of institutional effectiveness. Recently, a distinguished president of a community college, James Hudgens, and a professor of higher education, Dick Alford, tried to remember when they had first heard the term institutional effectiveness. Alfred believed he first encountered the term somewhere in the Ninchim's literature in 1983 or 84, while Hudgens remembers first hearing it from Sachs in 1984. The term is largely absent from the literature of higher education until the early to mid-1980s. Dr. James Rogers, former executive director of the Commission of Colleges of Sachs, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, claimed that the term was coined in 1984. As he noted, it was December 10, 1984, when the struggle and controversy finally ended. Little did the room full of presidents and deans at the Marriott Hotel in New Orleans realize that their decision that day would fundamentally change the way our commission evaluates and accredits institutions. After some months of discussion, hundreds of hours of committee meetings, rejection by the membership, and many concessions on all sides, the Commission on Colleges of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools had finally approved a standard on assessment. So controversial and even intimidating was the A word that new terminology had to be found to give a broader and more acceptable definition to the concept. The new term was institutional effectiveness. And today, more than a decade later, that term seems to have found its way into the general lexicon of assessment terminology as well as into the standards and verbiage of many of our accreditation colleagues. I have coined the term AAA or the three A's to refer to the origins of institutional effectiveness. The three A's are assessment, accreditation, and accountability. We'll now take a closer look at each of these three elements of institutional effectiveness in the next three slides. Assessment. As John Muffo, both a practitioner and scholar of institutional research, has noted, a basic definition of assessment would take into account the fundamental shift on inputs to one on outcome. A focus on inputs emphasizes resources to define quality in education. In this sense, using such factors as college rankings, funding, faculty degrees, and library holdings are input-driven. A focus on outputs looks at the end product of education or what students learn. This is why student learning outcomes are so essential in an output mode of addressing academic quality. Muffo goes on to state that a good way to conceptualize the term assessment is to ask, as suggested by Terenzini, a scholar of higher education, three questions. What is the purpose of assessment? What is the level of assessment and who is to be assessed? And three, what outcomes are to be assessed? In reference to the first question, what is the purpose of assessment? The enhancement of teaching and learning is formative assessment, while accountability to external organizations is summative assessment. With respect to the second question, what is the level of assessment and who is to be assessed, this would cover such things as in the individual student or groups, and the groups could be courses, departments, college, gender, race, etc. Finally, with respect to the third question, what outcomes are to be assessed, here we would look at such factors as knowledge, skills, attitudes, behavior, and so on and so forth. Accreditation. Accrediting agencies started proposing moving from inputs to outputs as early as the late 1970s, according to an article written by Dodd. And as we have seen, the actual term institutional effectiveness may well have been coined by Sachs. And if not, Sachs is largely responsible for institutionalizing it. Alan Gobson, a senior researcher for the SAS Institute in North Carolina, gave a presentation at the SAS Global Forum in 2007. He noted that, Our lesson from the brief historical overview of institutional effectiveness in higher education, then, is that accreditation has become a major driver of data-intensive efforts to demonstrate effectiveness. Accountability. Accountability is the third A in our triumvirate. Funding and enrollment declines in the 1970s affected the quality of American higher education. Accountability is largely driven by external forces, as increasingly governments, both local, state, and federal, accrediting agencies, students, and the public demand that colleges and universities be held accountable for their products. Pressures to demonstrate institutional effectiveness have, have arisen as a result of the high cost of higher education, 
accrediting agency requirements, college graduates unable to find meaningful employment, employer dissatisfaction with graduate knowledge and skills, attacks on academe from those within higher education, news stories criticizing colleges and universities, and the glacial nature of change within higher education. From a different perspective, one can say, as Rossman and L. Kwas do, that the institutional effectiveness has been driven by three primary forces, political, economic, and educational. Political pressures have come about from perceived weaknesses in higher education and the public's demand to know whether the high cost of education is justified. Economic, from an economic viewpoint, assessment is a way of it ensuring that the workforce to support national, state, and local economies is well-trained and competent. And educationally, as mentioned earlier, a number of educational reports, starting with the influential A Nation at Risk in 1983, have called for assessing quality. Derry Irwin, an assessment expert at James Madison University, have proposed a fourth, societal. This refers to the need for society to understand how a higher education meets public needs. Because the term institutional effectiveness came into the vocabulary of higher education as a result of SACS, it might prove helpful to see how the term was used by the organization. The criteria for accreditation was approved by the Commission of Colleges in December 1984. At the time, one institutional researcher quipped to me that the criteria was a guaranteed meal ticket for institutional researchers. The criteria were replaced in 2001 and 2002 by the Principles of Accreditation, a new set of accreditation requirements which places the same emphasis on institutional effectiveness as the older criteria, which we will discuss later in this module. As noted in the preamble section, preamble to section 3 of the criteria, the concept of institutional effectiveness is at the heart of the Commission's philosophy of accreditation and is central to instructional programs and operations. It pervades the criteria for accreditation. The preamble goes on to state, although evaluation of educational quality and effectiveness is a difficult task requiring careful analysis and professional judgment, each member institution is expected to document quality and effectiveness by employing a comprehensive system of planning and evaluation in all major aspects of the institution. The institutional effectiveness criteria were never prescriptive. As stated in the preamble, the Commission advocates no single interpretation of the concept of institutional effectiveness. It does, however, expect each member institution to develop a broad-based system to determine institutional effectiveness appropriate to its own context and purpose, to use this purpose statement as the foundation for planning and evaluation, to employ a variety of assessment methods, and to demonstrate use of the results of the planning and evaluation process for the improvement of both educational programs and support activities. The next five slides provide details from the SACS criteria describing requirements that would be used in its accreditation of institutions. The criteria were divided into six sections, the third of which concerned institutional effectiveness. Originally, it included two subsections, one in planning and evaluation, the other in institutional research. Later revisions expanded this to three sections, 3.1, planning and evaluation, educational programs, 3.2, planning and evaluation, administrative and educational support services, and 3.3, institutional research. Requirements for educational programs, section 3.1, included the following. Planning and evaluation for these activities must be systematic, broad-based, interrelated, and appropriate to the institution. The institution must define its expected educational results and describe its methods for analyzing the results. Establish a clearly defined purpose appropriate to collegiate education. Formulate educational goals consistent with the institution's purpose. Develop and implement procedures to evaluate the extent to which these educational goals are being achieved. Use the results of these evaluations to improve educational program services and operations. Develop guidelines and procedures to evaluate educational effectiveness, including the quality of student learning and of research and service. Encompass educational goals at all academic levels and research and service functions of the institution. 
and the institution must evaluate its success with respect to student achievement in relation to purpose, including, as appropriate, consideration of course completion, state licensing examinations, and job placement rates. Section 3.2 is similar to Section 3.1, except the emphasis is on administrative units and educational support services. Requirements included the following. The institution must demonstrate planning and evaluation in its administrative and educational support services, establish a clearly defined purpose which supports the institution's purpose and goals, two, formulate goals which support the purpose of each unit, three, develop and implement procedures to evaluate the extent to which these goals are being achieved in each unit, and four, use the results of the evaluation to improve administrative and educational support services. Section 3.3 was a guaranteed meal ticket for institutional researchers mentioned by my colleague. Requirements included, institutional research must be an integral part of the institution's planning and evaluation process, be effective in collecting and analyzing data and disseminating results, regularly evaluate the effectiveness of its institutional research process and use its findings for the improvement of its process, and assign administrative responsibility for conducting institutional research, allocate adequate resources, and allow access to relevant information. Institutional effectiveness today. Because of the pressures exerted by the AAA, assessment, accreditation, accountability, institutional effectiveness today is flourishing in all community colleges in America. Before we turn to structure and processes, we need to continue our examination of institutional effectiveness by spending a little more time on the concept itself and its definition, or I should say lack of definition. We will do this in Lesson 2. By the way, a list of sources used in this PowerPoint presentation begins with the next slide. In all lessons in this module, reference slides will follow the presentations.